Today I feel kind of tired and grumpy and I was wondering if it's something to do with a second night in a row of taking just one-eighth of my medications. But on second thought, it probably has more to do with PMS. So I think I'm just a little bit err today. And so it wasn't really good timing to watch a webinar put on by the Mental Health Commission of Canada on social enterprise. And it was called Social Enterprises, an Innovative Approach to Creating Employment Opportunities for People with Mental Illnesses. And they had a panel of speakers and they were people who had social enterprises and employed people with mental illnesses and other people who ran different kinds of enter social enterprises that actually were integrated with clinical services like reporting to the clinician about things and I thought that was a bit weird. Again, it's sort of warped into something that is being done to us. I don't know. Anyway, I think social enterprises are great and I think it was just more PMS hearing the way that some of them were talking. One person said, oh, sometimes we pair a healthy person up with a person with mental illness. Like what, how can someone judge who's healthy and who's not? And it's just lame to say that. And it really bothered me to hear the way they were talking about people. So it was actually a good reminder for me to remember how people who work in the system or in any kind of framework where they're saying, oh, these people over here have illnesses and we over here are healthy. It just really bothers me and it just rubbed me the wrong way. And I keep saying that. So it's a reminder that hearing that kind of stuff really, really gets me going and that might not be a good thing. And also, it's just interesting that I can talk and talk to myself and not upset myself, of course not, but just hearing the way people speak about people. And, and there was somebody who was an employer who didn't have a diagnosis of any kind saying, oh, I think it does this and it helps with this and it helps with that. And it just sounds so patronizing and paternalistic and prescriptive. And they did have two people working in social enterprise, people with labels and diagnoses, and they gave them about five minutes out of the whole hour, including the question period, which was half an hour, so five minutes out of the whole hour and a half. And I thought they'd have a little bit more information for people with labels who might want to start social enterprises, but it was more around integrating it into mental health services or sort of promoting businesses to have that social enterprise aspect and support people. And they did say some good things too. And it's also sad that people who are labeled get drugged up and then I think that cause thinking, oh, this person is mentally ill, they're mentally ill. But so much of it is just the numbing effects and side effects of medication. They talk about, oh, the cognitive impairment that goes along with the conditions. What do you mean? People are drugged. They can barely see straight. It's not because of the illness. It's because of being drugged. And I'm reading an article in the Sun magazine, and it features Sarah Davido, or Davidell. I don't know how to say her name. And I heard about her already by taking... Emma Bragdon's course on the peer movement on her website, Integrative Mental Health for You. And that's Integrative Mental Health University or something. And reading the article, she runs this recovery learning community in Western Mass. And that article is like music to my ears, just the way she says things and talks about things. So I was reading that this morning and then I heard the webinar and it's just going from from one beautiful perspective of receiving people to, oh, these people, we 
We pair these ill people with healthy volunteers or healthy individuals. It just, uh, I, I can't even, I don't even know what to say, and I probably shouldn't say anything further on the topic. But it would be cool to create some kind of recovery learning community. But I don't even like the word recovery, even in terms of recovering one's life or something, because it still implies that something is wrong with the person. And a lot of times crisis is needed for change. And I also feel like when this transformation happens, when this transformational crisis happens, certain functions atrophy and certain functions that don't yet have a place in society actually grow. And I feel like in order for our gifts and potential to come out, some of our functioning has to be shut down. Because if it wasn't, we would just continue functioning the way we were functioning. So it's actually part of the design of the crisis to make us non-functional, quote-unquote non-functional, in certain areas of society that have been overemphasized and people value way too much in life. And the only way for us to be acquainted with other values a lot of the times is to just make it so we actually have a very hard time participating in those structures. So even with social enterprise, one of the people who was talking made it sound kind of like the clinicians helped a person to decide you should work in social enterprise. So it's prescriptive. This is part of your recovery plan. You're going to work in this social enterprise. And they didn't say it that way. But sometimes if that's the only option, then that's the only option. So it's not really options. People in the clinical environment tend to think, oh, we created this great service and program, and so people will just want it. And that's what they have to do because that's all that's available. So it's prescriptive. It's coercive in a way. And I'm not saying that that's all that it's about because these services definitely help people a lot. But it's still delivered from the top down. It's delivered from these professionals that come in and say certain things about what it should look like. And so yeah, some of our functioning shuts down. So we can start to discover new functioning and new gifts and new potential and new ways of relating and new values of life, not just, oh, if you are able to work part-time in a job for the rest of your life, which will be 25 years shorter when you're in the mental health paradigm, then this is success. But maybe that's not success to us anymore. And maybe we are to be looking at other areas, and I feel like looking at the gifts and the potentials that come out are more important. Like maybe one of the gifts or potentials is creating new context through which to be able to allow the gifts and potentials to come out because there's a different understanding. So if there's these gifts and potentials trying to flower and then a person just said you're mentally ill and here's the programs available for you to recover through and try to fit back into society. But I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. So creating other contexts will allow our brains to see different ways that we could move through the world, even if it's just talking to ourselves. So society and the mental health system and the doctors and the clinicians want us to get back to functioning. But what is functioning? Isn't most of the world dysfunctional? And what's called functioning is actually, when you look at it at the bigger picture, it's actually quite dysfunctional. So can we think in terms of possibilities and, and potential and not recovery? Recovery is trying to fit back, functioning like a cog in the machine of society, as if that's going to make us happy and make our supposed symptoms go away. And maybe people try to go back into working and they get anxiety in social situations and then it's hard to function and maybe those situations are just wrong. Maybe we can sense all the negativity in people around us and it makes us anxious. It's, there's so many dynamics and things and, and people don't even get it. And recovery implies there's something wrong with not being able to function. There could be something right with it, which is 
atrophying those areas in the brain that are related to functioning in this dysfunctional society and trying to initiate energy flowing through other areas of the brain and that could be to bring online this other dimension and other capacities that are there that we don't know if they're there and what they are and how they unfold if we don't move into something else entirely because what is functioning working nine to five going home watching tv eating fast food having a car buying some crap like that's our life and when you think about that compared to what we get connected with in map consciousness there is no comparison so i say move back towards embodying map consciousness don't try to fit back into society and i don't remember if i talked about with my term see willing possibilities that seeing is willing possibilities without needing to will anything so we have the will of the ego and effort but when we're really seeing with clarity the seeing is the willing of possibilities so there is no willing or will separate from direct clear perception but when we're not clearly perceiving we think we need will and maybe we won't need the bandwidth of entertainment and information overload if we are living in our own living context so if we're always creating new memes and the mimetic structure is adding to itself and unfolding there's nothing static it's always moving so there's no need for any entertainment and the stories that we tell ourselves or our personal story is about the center it's about the me and it's also about the center in that it is around the center and circulates around the center so in the way of circulation it actually creates the center it probably is a centripetal force of some kind we are learning to live in the moment as the moment as that's where the love is and the moment is a movement it's a different movement than our thoughts about it and could so-called relapse really be a relapse into a conversation with Gaia could be an episode of Gaia log and I don't know if I ever changed the word ego to see go and it's sort of like see and go perception and action so when we transform we don't have an ego but we have a seago so the C frontal cortex becomes the seat of the seago which is that brain structure is devoted to perception and action without the delay of thought and it seems like in map consciousness the energy in the brain is starting to redistribute so one of the important things could be to know how to channel energy and share it and and move with this redirecting of energy process and i feel like when we don't understand that and know how to do that it gets translated into moods because we don't know how to actually communicate something so it's held in and then that energy is directed into changing our mood or the way we appear to other people but if we're able to actually communicate something then we won't appear that way to other people or ourselves and can we go from medication to meditation and not meditation as in sitting there staring at the wall and breathing but meditation in the sense that krishnamurti talks about it which is complete awareness of everything every day in daily activities of life and i actually realized that on saturday it could mark the first day of officially being a psychiatric survivor and i'm not sure how long that will last that i'm off medication hopefully it's forever and i do feel like being diagnosed with a mental illness can be a path to enlightenment 
And that's a lot more hopeful statement than, oh, you have to take medications for the rest of your life. You'll have a good life. You'll be able to do most things that people do, but people don't tell you that you'll feel like crap on the medication. And then you'll die 25 years earlier than everyone else. So maybe when I get back to my hometown, I will start a harm reduction group for coming off psych meds. And a note to self, speed of light, speed of sound, law of least action, the speed of freedom. Instantaneous, one plank length. And this is going to be a bipolar big bang. And I noticed too when listening to that webinar that it seems like the more we try to function, people who go into map consciousness, the more we try to function, the more symptomatic we are. So we get more, say, anxiety or something. And what does that say about functioning? If we were truly operating in the true function of being a human being, wouldn't more functioning create more functioning? So what is it that creates more functioning? And I think functioning in the current society is actually dysfunctional. It's against our neurology. So much so that a good percentage of people have to be drugged to be able to attempt to participate in that again. And I started to write a business plan a while ago for special messages wellness. Making making the world a better place for those who have been labeled. And I don't really like that statement that much because it's still a negative statement. But it's more about the peer potential project, which is bringing out the potential of peers. And it would be cool if the peer potential project was a social enterprise that we co-create together based on our unfolding potentials as we interact and relate in ways that are diet and provolog ish and have a manic epimimetics project recontextualizing from the inside out. So getting together and recontextualizing and talking about things in our terms, on our terms. And part of the purpose too was to render psychiatry, medicating and labeling obsolete to create a space of thinking together as one entity. To harvest mania for the good of humanity. Conscious self-sabotage of the ego and inconsistency random decontravisions, to collaborate with humanics, to find the people who can support people through this transformational process, to create a community of people who see in these ways, to increase wellness literacy and human capacity literacy for this specific type of neurotribe of people, to increase visionary literacy, to increase lifestyle design practices, manic lifestyle design, and happiness first, to augment human capacities of kindness, altruism, laughter, play, spontaneity, the list goes on, all the characteristics that really make life worth living, to normalize distress and extraordinize living, to increase social capital and create a new social capital that is yet to be recognized, to create gatekeepers, to extreme well-being and thriving, to restore the brain to learning, to create safety to be manic, like in clowning or DJing or improv. So safe outlets for some of that energy that comes through when we're first really being animated. Provides safe space. Set up public displays of happiness and celebration. Train a human distress crew that can go out and help prevent people from being funneled into the mental health system. Create a resource of lived experience tips and also on relanguaging. And create a conference for people who go into manic, magic consciousness. Not about the pathology, 
but about possibility and potential. Create more and more memes for Mannix and create a culture and a language so that we don't default into the language and give our experiences over to the mental health authorities. And if we have that language, we're not gonna believe their language. And maybe in terms of prevention, having some people who go through this transformation speak with youth, not about, oh, this is my mental illness and this is how I got help and blah, 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 but actually on how important it is to actually be who they are, to really do that at all costs, even against the pressures of their parents. If they want to be a farmer and their parents say you have to be a doctor, be a farmer because you'll be a doctor but you'll be on some kind of pill. And that's not life. So prevention, not this early intervention stuff of when all these kids have this anxiety. Why are they having this? It's because of we're not allowed to be who we are and who we came here to be. We get funneled into the machinery of society at such a young age. And at some point, something breaks. And it's important to go for what it is that you want in your heart. And I was thinking today, I think the most important thing for me and what I can do perhaps is maybe help people come off medication somehow because without that we're really still moving in the paradigm of the mental health system and our possibilities and our potential are really limited because we're drugged up we can't see properly we can't think straight we are not ourselves and and it's just so tragic And through these talks with myself, I've talked about things that I want to create, but most of them I can't create by myself. And so I might actually just wait to create something until I get some feedback of some sort and know what to move forward with, because right now I really don't know. I don't really know how to help people and I, I think it's almost rude to even imagine that I would know how. But I guess sharing my journey and dialogue with myself, the main thing I would invite people to do is think about things on your own terms, in your own terms. Make up your own terms if there's no terms to describe it. and see what happens. Make meaning out of these experiences. They have meaning. And maybe it's not meaning ultimately, but there's some kind of meaning moment to moment. And we can never really know exactly what that is, but we can try to put some of that felt sense into words. And it's difficult when we first get in touch with this, putting these felt senses into words, when usually we're just throwing words back at words, throwing words back and forth to each other as human beings. But these sensations we have, they're for ourselves, and we can kind of relate them. I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I'm pretty much finished extrapolating that notebook. I have a page of things left that I could talk about, but I have to look some of them up. So maybe I will start listening to my old videos. So then I can do a bit of a summary for the video and make a few points on what I talk about in each video. I don't know if I'll do that or not, but it depends if there's energy behind it. If I feel like I'm able to learn something or make it more helpful in some way because when I first started doing it I wasn't 
intending it for anything helpful in particular, but maybe looking back at it now, knowing what I know now a year later, maybe I'll be able to learn from it and and make it more searchable or something. Again, I don't know what I'm talking about. So yeah, starting tomorrow, it'll be 20 days until the one year mark. I had a pretty good sleep last night, but I'm feeling kind of tired in my eyes. I probably slept from 10 until about 6 a.m., so I'm waking up earlier, which is nice. It's nice not to go to bed at 10 and sleep until 10 and need 12 hours of sleep. And I'm going to talk to Hardy Nutritionals later today, hopefully, and ask them about how long I should continue to take the liposomal vitamin C and then order more if I need to. And also ask about if I could do a ketogenic diet and I read through that article in the Sun magazine. It's from the April 2017 issue, and it's with Sarah Davido, or David Dow. And there was one sentence in there that made me think of something that the sentence wasn't necessarily intended for. So it's a bit of an extrapolation. But the interviewer said, why is it important for people's extreme experiences to be regarded as meaningful instead of symptoms? And then Sarah replied, because they are meaningful. But what my brain saw when I read that question was, symptoms aren't symptoms, they're meanings. It's not that they're meaningful symptoms, it's their actual meanings. And it's just a bit of a distinction, but I think it's really important. And they're meanings we don't quite know how to make meaning of, and they're meanings we don't quite understand, and they're meanings we don't quite understand what they're trying to say and communicate. So it's a mystery of meanings in a way. Whereas usually when we're operating based on our thoughts and everything is going apparently smoothly in life, we understand the meanings of our thoughts. But when it goes beyond that, we don't understand the meaning. So there's something that we need to understand. If we just understood the meanings, then it would be within the realm of what we already know, and they wouldn't be jarring at all. And, and the jarringness of the meanings is what creates the growth or understanding. And we can only move through it with understanding. We can't move through it just by drugging these meanings. They're not symptoms. They're meanings. Or we might even call a uh, sore back a symptom. But it means something. And if it's just a symptom of a disease, then you, you might drug the back pain all the while further injuring it. So it's the same with these so-called psychological symptoms, they're not really symptoms, they're meanings of some kind that if we understand the meaning and and grow and heal and move through it, then that becomes part of our understanding. It's not something beyond our psyche. It's not a hallucination beyond our psyche. It's not something beyond. It's it is beyond when it comes up and we don't understand, but as we move towards understanding, it's no longer beyond, and so it's no longer something that is distressing. So I think reframing what somebody might call a symptom as a meaning invites a question, well, what is the meaning of this meaning? Or what is it saying, or what is it trying to communicate? Not just, oh, it's a symptom, so let's suppress it, let's take a pill. So it's not even that these extreme experiences are meaningful. They are meaning. And they invite us to look at something. 
and they invite us to look at something that is outside our zone of what we know and understand so that we might understand it. So that feels really important to me. And it goes along with what I was saying about how it's a meaning-making process. Well, it's a process in which other meanings arise in consciousness that we can then make meaning out of and integrate and move through and move beyond and then other meanings will arise and we take our regular consciousness thought structure to be so meaningful but when it breaks up we actually have access to meanings beyond what our thought structures and beliefs tell us So it's meaning beyond our programs. And maybe part of our programming is to suppress a lot of the meanings that happen in life, say through trauma. We're able to suppress them, but when that mechanism breaks open, then we have to make meanings of some of those traumas, or at least look at them. It doesn't mean we need to get stuck in them and lost in them forever, but at least look at them when we weren't able to at a different point in our life maybe partly because we're programmed not to and then can we move into the flow of meaning instead of reverting back to the flow of thought that actually suppresses this flow and flux and evolution of meaning making and congeals and coalesces it back into a structure of just beliefs and thoughts. Because when our brain goes into meaning making, we really have to work. Our brain really has to work. We really have to pay attention. We really have to see. We have to wonder. Whereas when the thought structure is going on, we don't really wonder about anything. So that could be part of the mechanism of thought, is to be efficient in not having to actually look at things. To just operate in a semi-conscious state. And partly because we don't actually want to be conscious of some of the things related to past trauma or the trauma of the world or what's going on in the world. So it prevents this information overload. It prevents us from seeing new meanings that might lead us to act in new ways. But one day we might see a certain meaning altogether and act in, in unity. We might see it as necessary to make meaning. Not just believe thoughts and believe ideas and believe meanings, but make it. Actually create it, actually channel it, not just make it by this thought plus that thought equals this meaning. No, but something completely new. And I feel like the brain needs to flush out old meanings in order to get in alignment with that state of just making meanings new and afresh. Because we've stored and suppressed all these meanings that we couldn't look at and then in psychosis it's like molting old meaning holograms and we have to look at them. But if we can look and not try to do anything then eventually we can just look at new meanings that arise that have nothing to do with the past. Yesterday I was walking and I was walking down a little path and all of a sudden a hummingbird flew right in front of me and just hovered and looked at me and then kind of did this thing where, where it kind of flew like this towards me like, and it actually was like, whoa. And then it was kind of funny because it's this tiny little hummingbird. But it was just interesting that it actually hovered there for a little while and looked at me and 
almost came closer, not flew away. So psychosis is molting old meanings. And those meanings aren't the truth. But it's molting them so then we can be in contact with reality and not have a shadow of old meanings in our brain. It's shedding the brain damage from the false meanings of society and having to move through that. And the thing with the symptoms versus meanings thing too is if we think something is a symptom then we go to a doctor and they tell us what that means. So if someone's hearing voices, they go to a doctor and the doctor says what that means. Oh, you have a mental illness and that means you should take this pill for the rest of your life. But if we can make other meaning out of it, maybe that thing changes. Maybe it changes in meaning or maybe it actually goes away or changes in how it comes about or there's some understanding there. But in order to understand something, we really have to look at it and wonder and not know. Because when we don't understand something, we don't know. And we have to understand that we don't know and look. And then by looking, perhaps some understanding will arise. And part of the process too is this new meaning that's arising when we don't understand it. It's outside of the understanding of what we already understand. So by that very process, it is the unknown making itself available to be understood. So not knowing is really important. And this could actually be the brain's invitation into the state of not knowing, which is important for seeing and making meaning and moving in the field of meaning moving forward. So even just understanding that we don't know is an important understanding. And not knowing and watching it unfold as opposed to thinking we know and putting it in a premature box. And that's what psychiatry does. It puts it in this box and then medicates it and then we never have a chance for understanding because even all the medication is going to change the way that we understand these meanings and it's actually going to warp the meanings into other side effects which are other supposed symptoms so when a medication causes a side effect which could actually be worsening of something like voices or or feeling in certain ways, now that drug has actually transformed the original meaning into a different meaning. So if we're now trying to translate these different meanings resulting from the drugs, we're not looking at the root of it. And so we're now always stuck in the periphery of meanings that were transformed into something through the drug. So we're actually looking at a transformation of the meaning to something else. And so we're not looking at the right thing anymore. 
So through that, we'll be always lost in, in an endless web of the wrong meanings because they're transformed by the drugs into side effects, which are different meanings than the original meaning. So I might have, say, five supposed symptoms or meanings, and then I take a pill, and now I end up with 10 side effects and not those five original meanings or symptoms. And maybe the 10 side effects are a little bit less than the original symptoms. But it's just translated it into something else. It hasn't really fixed anything. Now if I'm trying to fix those side effects or moving in my life according to this structure of side effects, I'm moving in the wrong field of meaning. And that's going to produce further and further and further disorder over time. Because eventually some other symptom or side effect will come up as a result of the medication transforming the original process. So in that way, it'll always keep perpetuating itself. And then we'll need another drug, and then we'll need to switch drugs, and then, because we're working on the wrong meanings. So how can we really... How can we really see if we're having our meanings translated by psychiatry with the stories they tell us and then translated even physiologically in the reaction we have to the medication? It produces side effects, which is transforming the original meanings and maybe diluting them and, and warping them into something a bit more bearable. You know, instead of extreme anxiety, now one might weigh 300 pounds. So that's going to change one's life, shorten one's life. Um, and maybe one will be dealing with the 300 pound thing and not the original anxiety. When if we're able to deal with the original anxiety, and I'm just using these words for convenience, like in sounding like medical symptoms, we wouldn't have to deal with the 300 pounds thing. So... Or deal with having to take diabetes medication later or something else. So it's just transforming it into this something else. It's actually transforming the original energetic process into an actual physical problem in terms of a person not being ideally healthy because of medication side effects. And that funnels the person along a completely different trajectory of meanings. And yeah, it's just... I can see what I'm saying, and I wonder if anyone else will. Today is going to be the last night that I take psychotropic medications. I have my one-eighth amount of trazodone and my one-eighth amount of lithium. And I was originally taking 600 milligrams so I broke a 150 and half, which is 75 milligrams, which is one eighth of 600 milligrams. And I've been taking this for four days, this dosage, and this will be the fifth night. And tomorrow night I won't take any. I spoke with Hardy Nutritionals today, and they said that I can continue to take the Benadryl for maybe a week or so, but I will talk with them about that later. So I'm kind of glad about that because it will be nice to have some assistance sleeping, even if it's not psychotropic in any way. So I'll be off the psychotropics, but I won't be off the meds completely yet. And that's good because a friend is coming tonight and I want to be able to sleep these next three nights while she's here visiting. And I asked them about doing a ketogenic diet in a few weeks, and they said it's best not to do anything too jarring to the system, anything that will be way too detoxing, because it could be jarring. And the system should just keep going at the natural pace it's going of eliminating whatever drug residues remain. And that made sense to me. I initially thought it might be cool to do a ketogenic diet before I go home and get in a little bit better shape because it would probably make me lose about 5 or 10 pounds. Not that I really feel like I need to lose weight, but I know that I've gained a few pounds since I got here. 
So I just thought going home in good shape would be cool. Plus, right now I'm just focusing on tapering off the meds. I'm not really doing anything extra. So when I don't have to focus on that, I thought I could focus on changing my diet. They said I could eat a little healthier, which makes sense, but just don't do anything too jarring. And switching my whole metabolism to burning fat for fuel might be a little intense right now. So that's kind of cool. I can put my efforts elsewhere. And they said continue to take the vitamin C. I've been taking it at breakfast and at lunch, 15 minutes before. And they said maybe try doing it breakfast and dinner. I thought the vitamin C would be stimulating, but they said it's not. It actually helps you sleep. So now that I won't be taking meds at night, I could even take it lunch and bedtime or morning and dinner, whatever I want. And they said I could play around with that. Or I could take it just once a day and if I feel some kind of withdrawal symptoms, take it. And they said I could take up to three a day, but it might be good for the next week to take two a day consistently. So that's the story on the lipospheric vitamin C. I ordered another box from Amazon and it was $60 American. So the supplements right now, if I was taking two a day of those, and it's a box of 60, that would take two boxes, so that's $120 US a month for vitamin C. But they said I only need that for about two months. And the Hardy Nutritionals, um, the price varies, but I would say with the Hardy Nutritionals and the amino acids, it's about like 120 to 150 so say say $300 a month ish on supplements right now and that would probably continue at 150 ish when I don't have to take so much of the vitamin C at some point but say it averages out to about 200 to 250 dollars a month depending on what I'm doing exactly and it could be quite a bit less. It could be 150 to 250. I actually did a calculation of paying that amount of money for the next So I actually did a calculation and and if I continue to take this stuff for say the next 50 years and it would be 50 years because starting tomorrow I will officially participating in the mental health system. So right now I'm 35 so it seems like a fun age to die when in the mental health system is around 60 years old. Look at Carrie Fisher, and I'm sure there's other examples. So she's missing 25 years of her life, which would put her up to 85, which females can live to quite comfortably nowadays. So she lost her 25 years. And so that's 25 years more of life. I did some calculations, and it'll be 25 years until I turn 60. And if I want to live till 85, then that's 25 more years. So that is 50 years. So the cost of this for 50 years 
times 12 months times $150 per month is about $90,000. So $90,000 to live another 50 years as opposed to 25 years. I think that's a pretty good deal, especially when it's broken down into monthly payments of just $150. And I don't know if this is true because I can't necessarily predict the future, but I've possibly changed the trajectory of my life. And it's not over. I still have to take my dose tonight and then live a night and a day without taking any medications. And I mentioned before that I did taper off before and through the weeks after being off everything, I was back in the hospital. So I'm not oblivious to that possibility. And the amino acids, I have perhaps given myself a better chance. I know for sure that I feel a lot better. I had some definite PMS yesterday, so I just spent some time in a very beautiful environment and just sat there and relaxed. And it was interesting. I really surrendered into just being still and being silent and I was outside and sitting somewhere quiet and then I came back and I was laying in bed and I was really just planning on just laying there still and just being with this sort of weird energy in my eyes and things that I was attributing more to PMS than anything else and then all of a sudden I just popped out of bed and I started doing all this work on my computer and organizing some of the videos that I made and things like that and it seems like my brain has started to look at some of these videos and put them in order. I have them in different playlists according to month for the, so those are all in order now up until May 31st. And I'm gonna go back through all the videos and remove all the enhancements that made it look all warpy that I didn't really know what I was doing with that. And that'll take some time. And some of the videos have a bunch of ads and some of them have none. And I think I'm just going to put one at the beginning of some of them, or maybe some of them none, and then some of them one at the beginning after a while. Um, so if people watch it in order, they'll sort of think, well, yeah, it's worth watching an ad for, and perhaps not having any. I don't know. I kind of want to see how the ad thing works and how it kind of works in general so I'll probably just try it not with the intention to really keep it I'm I'm hoping that it sparks more meaningful things than just a few cents from ads like people actually feel called to reach out and and to to form new contexts and have new conversations and and I don't know like I really don't know so putting a few things in place and seeing what happens. I think more of what happens is about the dialogue and not about money. Like, I don't care about that. It's just more of an experiment. And also putting in some tags so people can find SoundCloud and then some keep unlisted on YouTube and then just post them on my blog to keep them at first just within a narrow population of people who understand this conversation so it doesn't get listened to by the wrong ears that will just obviously misinterpret it. So it would be great for us to talk amongst ourselves first. And so my brain is just kind of taking time and doing little bits of this at a time and seeing now that it's coming up to a year of talking to myself it's actually moving into being able to do something with the conversations. Whereas a couple of months ago, I was just like, blah, and just talking to myself that because that's the main thing I could do. And it's also at the same time as coming up meds, feeling more clear and also feeling like the purpose of the dialogue was fulfilled, even though I don't know when I set that up as a hope of being able to talk to myself and talk myself out of the system or even do this for a year so I might actually start listening to some of my videos I really did start making videos on June 7th actually 
I made a bunch without any editing, just talking after the naturopath. And it's kind of funny because it's not edited, so I'm going like Mash, and like this and wiping my face. And I think I was more fidgety then, even now. Editing things, there's not that much to get rid of. It's more actually making mistakes in what I'm saying. And it's, I think it's actually because it's unscripted. If I had something that I was following to say, I don't think I would make as many mistakes if I sort of like practiced before and then practiced that chunk and then got that chunk perfect. But the reason I can't do that is because whatever I say, it came out of nowhere and I can't stop and start again because that will actually change what I was going to say. So I just start from where I left off and then cut out the mistake and that's why there's breaks mid-sentence because I can't plan what I'm going to say so I can't say oh I said what I was planning to say wrong so I'm just going to say it again. It doesn't work that way. So it's interesting with that especially when I'm doing extrapolations because it's really coming from somewhere else than some kind of story and it's something new so that newness actually makes mistakes in what it's trying to say because it's not something it's preformed and and made a formula of to try to sound smart it's actually it's like baby steps again it's like learning how to speak from this other place so sometimes there are mistakes so I cut those out but I didn't edit those videos so they're kind of funny so I don't know if I will put them with the full playlist Though, if I release them as audios at first, which I'm planning to do, it won't really matter. And I actually have four videos from June 7th and five videos from June 8th that aren't on my big playlist of 186 videos right now. This will be the 286 videos, actually, and this will be the 287th. So if you include those nine that's 296 so if I do the June 7th mark I have a few days I have five days to make three videos but if I do the June 20th mark I have I have 18 days to make 13 videos something like that doesn't really matter but it would be cool to make the 300 by June 7th and then kind of the 300 again by June 20th and it would be extra cool to make 365 by September 11th and I'll have a friend here so I won't be able to talk as much but I will definitely make a video especially Sunday being my first day after a night of not taking psychotropic drugs. I did put some of the audios that I made of this book that I was kind of writing two years ago. It wasn't a book, it was just sort of notes when I was researching psychosis more and coming off my meds and so I made quite a bit of notes and I was thinking of turning it into a book but I have trouble with editing in terms of trying to make it into some kind of format. That's so why I really like this format of just talking to myself, editing out the mistakes, but not the content, and being done with it. Though, I think I might start watching some of the old videos kind of on the anniversary date or around then, and then that way I can add in some search keywords and and maybe kind of figure out what I was talking about. The one thing I am concerned about, it's not really a concern, is I'm very sensitive so watching myself a year ago might actually put me back into a state of a year ago a little bit. Not really but I don't know, just hearing those things. So I really am not sure if I want to do that. We'll see. Another thing I could do is ask people who watch the videos to send me keywords because that way I don't have to watch them again. 
and I can just figure it out that way. Because it would be kind of cool to not spend too much time on this process moving forward, like make short videos here and there, but not really go into extrapolation. And watching videos takes time, and then I might have a tendency to want to extrapolate them or make some notes on them to maybe put something together that's comprehensible, or make notes on what clips to include in something smaller, like make a smaller thing, maybe like a two hour summary something of old clips. That would require a faster and more powerful computer for sure. So yeah, I'm not really sure where it will go. But at the same time, I see that I have put a lot of energy into this. So even if I go for another year on this process, but in a different way, it could be good because I've put a lot of energy into this conversation. So where does it want to go next? And how does it want to go there? And, and I'm not really sure. And it sounds like I will be leaving California on June 24th. It's a Monday. And on June 25th, and I will likely take the train because I find it less stressful. And so I will be back at home on the 25th. And the 26th will actually be my first day there. And hopefully that day I will get to see my friends and my community. And that feeling of really wanting to leave isn't there. It was a little bit yesterday, but it's not really as strong. So I feel like I can keep going for the next six or seven weeks. And I'm not sure what'll happen. It'll be a different context to not be taking any meds and have six or seven weeks off the meds before I go back home, which is an environment where I'll be somewhat expected to go participate with the system again or or like make an appointment necessary. And will I continue to wonder about extreme states when I no longer feel like I'll go into extreme states or if I do I won't necessarily medicate them. And that's kind of the risk in the next while, is if something does happen, I won't want to medicate the extreme state because I just finished tapering off that crap. So I wonder what there will be to talk about with myself. Will there be anything to talk about? Maybe it'll be more about sharing in order to create context, but not necessarily about creating more context. Or maybe there'll be some other context to create. A context of what does a brain wonder about and and think about and see and and go into when not needing to always refer subtly or or in a manifest or gross way to something related to mental health. It's one thing to have experiences and think they have something to do with mental illness, and it's another to have experience and think it's not something to do with the mental illness but still be medicated like it is. And then it's another to maybe be off meds and not having those experiences because there's a chance that some of my supposed relapses could actually be caused from taking those medications for too long and the toxicity associated with that. And that's what can happen is, oh, you need a med change when it could be the toxicity accumulating and then those meds no longer work and you just have to switch to a different poisoning mechanism in order to be okay. 
for a while till the next change and I don't know I'm just wondering what does a brain see and wonder about when no longer having to refer to that paradigm because one isn't taking the medications and participating in it even if one does not subscribe to it so what will the brain see when it's no longer coerced back into that paradigm it's warped and coerced into something that is just this awful outlook and awful and all this wonderful language where is the stigma when one has transcended and I could be getting way ahead of myself by saying these things. But at the same time, I'm sure I've been saying things that were way ahead of what I was doing all along the way. Just talking about not wanting to take meds all along the way. And then all of a sudden being off meds. At this point, I'm wondering what it will be like to be off of them. And maybe I'll know after a month or two of being off of them what that actually looks like and feels like or like how does one speak how does one see when not having to see through all of these experiences that one has had because one was put into the mental health paradigm do those experiences slowly fade away in memory because they no longer serve any purpose and in two months I could be back on these meds and, and singing a sad song but I could also be feeling very free so I'm just wondering and maybe now that I'm at this point where tonight will be the last night of taking meds for however long my brain is just giving voice to wondering about what that's going to be like again. Because in the last six years, I've probably only had 15 medication-free days. And I did have maybe a month or so on a very, very low dose of lithium. So maximum a month or two of no meds to very little. What will be the eye structure when it's not with this whole chemical band-aid? Will there be more things that I have to deal with? Will there be more things that I have to look at? And I am having a sense that that's true. And I think that's partly why it's important to get this conversation I've had with myself in order so I don't lose sight of and not getting too detached from this whole conversation and almost transcending it to a point where I forget about it and forget that it did seem to have some value at some point. So the altruism is important. And I think I talked a lot more of those elements. So it might be good to actually remind myself why I even started talking to myself in the first place. Because my brain has a tendency to forget. And that could have been part of why I actually recorded what I was saying to myself so I could go back and look at it. Even if no one else ever sees it, if I'm able to go back and look at it and and remember why the heck am I here? What the heck am I doing? I don't even know. I came to California for a reprieve and I didn't know I would end up healing. And will I be afraid to speak up about it? For some reason I always think that I don't know anything, so who am I to say anything? And I've said all these things to myself. 
and I've framed it in a way of talking to myself because I'm not telling anyone what to do, say, think. I'm just talking to myself and and I'm 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 allowed to do that. But I don't know if I can do anything more beyond that because I really don't know. And it would be great to be in a space of not knowing with other people, just really coming together and saying, I really don't know anything. And I feel that people like me can actually say that because we've had such mind expanding experiences that show us that we really don't know how this world works and how the brain works and what's going on and and maybe in dialogue with each other we can actually find a new meaningful context through which to move through life. Krishnamurti talks about a totally different way of living and I think we get in contact with that in map consciousness but we don't quite figure it out or we don't have enough people around us who are also trying to figure this out in order to make it something of a ground to stand on. So yeah, I hope I have a fun weekend with my friend and enjoy the first few days of freedom from psychoactive chemicals and and then my friend has a good time and goes home happy and I continue to work on this and talk to myself here and there and who knows what's going to happen next it's 2.20 in the morning and my friend arrived at at about 11.30 p.m. and and then she was like on the phone for like an hour and I just wanted her to go to sleep and and then I woke up at like 1.30 and It felt like I was waking up instead of falling asleep and now I feel wide awake. I feel like what I was talking about with my friend coming here from back home, the worst case scenario is happening. It's like I could feel all the energy she was carrying with her because she's so stressed out from work and everything and I feel so sensitive to it. I feel like my heart can't take it. So now I feel like I have to get through these next two and a half days and how am I going to do that with no sleep? I feel like I risked her coming here and it was totally a mistake. I feel wide awake like I'm not going to sleep tonight for sure. It's like I missed the window of falling asleep and I stayed up late to await her arrival. And then she just gives me a glance, oh hey, how's it going? And then just on her phone and it feels like such a disconnect. And so-called normal people just don't understand this stuff. And I feel like I'm just... I don't know. I was laying in bed and feeling like in so much pain in my whole body and I know it coincides with coming off these meds but I feel like just having that other energy here is not helping I feel like yelling just get the f here just get out leave me alone like why did you come here And I feel some double meaning in what I'm saying, like it's resonating with past trauma.
and I feel like I'll just have to go home and now I've sort of ruined this last time and I'll be leaving on a bad note. I feel like one of my best friends is here to visit me but I feel so alone at the same time. Like I'm struggling yet I can't wake up and get him. But I'm... I'm struggling and I feel like I can't wake her up and say... It feels like almost like it might feel when I go home, just so much old energy. But her timing of being here just feels partly symbolic of the old energy and needing to deal with that at the same time as tapering off meds. And now I feel like I'm going to have to pretend I'm okay for these next few days when I'm not. I don't, I feel like I'm never going to sleep again. Maybe it's just PMS insomnia. I really hope so. It feels like as bad as how I couldn't sleep the night before I left for California. Feels like there's no such thing as time and only levels of consciousness and my level of consciousness went back down. It feels like I can feel all her stress and she's really stressed out. I'm so sensitive and I wonder if I'll be able to help. I'm so useless, I can't even fall asleep when I have a friend nearby that has chaotic energy. I've never had to do this, talk to myself. I feel like it'd be easier just to take a Seroquel and go to sleep, but then I'd be right back at the beginning. I took another Benadryl, but that didn't work. So I might take a couple amino acid caps and then maybe take some hearty nutritionals even though it can be stimulating. I feel like maybe I need the extra vitamins to kind of process some of the stress. And I did get up and take another vitamin C and it feels like that woke me up so maybe it is stimulating for me. never had this happen here where I can't sleep before I'd be able to take another drug and I just feel so shaken up my heart feels it the most I can feel this stress I think I just have to move through some of this I just took two amino acids and when I got to this other area I actually looked for a place to zap strap myself just in case I feel on the verge of PTSD flashbacks and that's why it's good to have a bag always packed and ready my purse has my zap straps it does have PRNs I have extra hearty nutritionals, I have water, I have headphones, I have a charger for my phone, but I grab the very sturdy charger, the one that doesn't break and and it can pretty much tow a car and I'm afraid of this charger because if I did freak out, I might somehow do something to myself with this charger. I don't want to. I want to 
get through this. Maybe I'm just supposed to be up tonight by myself getting through this. The one thing that's not good is I don't have that much memory left on my phone. So I need more space on my phone to talk to myself. And my friend, my brain twin, gave me an iPhone and I was just going to keep it safe for him, but maybe I should start using it because it has a lot of memory on it and I need that extra space just in case something like this happens. I need to be able to keep witnessing myself when I need to. Again, I'm just so alone in this. I was laying in bed and I was starting to have this sensation in my body that brought me back to my childhood where I'd feel this pain and this just awful, nauseous type feeling without feeling nauseous. One time two years ago, over two years ago, I had a friend videotape me when I was in psychosis. I thought it would help witness the process. I could share that too. It's not pretty, but it's part of this. So yeah, I felt like I had that heart energy, but it was faint. And it was more like trying to pass into that tunnel of sleep, but then just passing into a tunnel of complete awakeness. Maybe tomorrow I can do some coherence breathing. I didn't grab my chest strap. Again, just having to go through this alone. It's interesting, I feel more calm after about 10 minutes of talk. Tired yet? It's 2.30, I think. If I get three hours of sleep, I will be happy. Even if I go to bed at 6 and wake up at 9. My mouth feels really, really dry. So I just took 6 of the amino acid caps. In 15 or 20 minutes, I'll take two of the micronutrient supplements. And it's interesting, I'm staying up and I'm staying awake and I'm taking nutrients instead of drugging myself with Seroquel. Maybe my body's looking for the easy way out, it's just looking to be drugged drug back to sleep. Can I really be with this? And I was talking about how I might have to process other things and this could just be part of it. And my friend being here is just triggering the inevitable. Maybe I just don't need sleep tonight. I could ask for my brain twin for support. Or one other friend I made here. Or another friend I made here. Or a friend that I made here who lives overseas. And I'm going to call Hardy Nutritionals on Monday. It's been 45 minutes since I took the amino acid caps and I'm feeling really tired and sedated so I'm trying to wait till I'm ready to fall asleep until I go back to bed. I think tomorrow I'll just tr tell my friend that I had really bad pre-period insomnia and restless legs. She doesn't speak my language. She doesn't speak that context. And I don't want it to be 
downhill spiral to me not speaking my own context either. Maybe I just need to be awake to process some of these energies that are coming at me as a result from seeing someone from my other life. And it's also making me feel like maybe I never want to leave here. Whereas recently I've been wanting to go home, but if this is intense, then what will that be like? So this is my first day with no drugs and last night was a disaster too because I was falling asleep and then my friend as I was falling asleep said Hey, what's your Instagram name? And it scared me and then woke me up and I couldn't fall asleep for another hour So it was a really big disaster and I got really mad and that was a disaster too But I did manage to fall asleep and I slept like nine hours after sleeping only four so that was good so hopefully I'll get through today. I'm gonna go on a boat and then get through tomorrow and then just spend some time resting up. And it's a good learning experience for when I go back home and being around people. So that's a quick update.